will promise you I'll bring this up with Randy Shriver to, uh, later today about the Memorandum of Understanding on Countering Disinformation. It's a very uh, interesting uh, proposal. Uh, we're, I ask now the, the next panel to come up and assume your positions here, and we'll be, launch our right into the next panel. So give me one second as Nadesh, you're coming. All right, good morning, everyone, and, uh, and welcome to the first panel uh, for this year's China Defense and Security Conference. Uh, my name is Russell Shao. I'm the Executive Director at the Global Taiwan Institute. On behalf of GTI, we are a 501c3 think tank dedicated exclusively to Taiwan policy research and related programming. And we are delighted to be one of the co-sponsors uh, for this year's uh, China Defense and Security Conference, in particular for this uh, panel here. Um, and personally, it's uh, always great to be back here at Jamestown Foundation. Um, uh, as some of you may not know, I actually was the first one to initiate the first China Defense and Security Conference back in 2011. So it's uh, great to be back here, not only as a co-sponsor, but certainly as uh, someone who, is, uh, who, who really uh, values uh, the, uh, the work that, uh, G um, that Jamestown Foundation is doing. Uh, in um, promoting greater research and understanding about China defense and security uh, issues. And I think um, Lieutenant General Chen just really uh, teed up a great deal of, uh, of issues for us to discuss here on the first panel. And, um, and as someone who has actually done some uh, research in this area, uh, looking at the nexus of propaganda and influence operations, and specifically at United Front, um, I think he wonderfully captured um, you know, some of the predicaments and challenges and, and threats uh, that Taiwan faces, as I often do in uh, comments that I make to colleagues as well as uh, in public. In many cases, I look at Taiwan and what's happening in Taiwan as a bellwether for many of the issues and challenges that the world uh, faces uh, now with regards to the rise of the Chinese Communist Party uh, and the influence that that has had on the uh, liberal world order. Now, in regards to uh, the first panel here today, as I know that you are all here to hear, listen from our very esteemed uh, speakers, I will uh, you know, quickly turn it over to them and only to say that I am, uh, cannot be more uh, delighted and honored to be on stage uh, with them. Uh, and first, we have uh, John Dotson, uh, who has assumed the responsibility of China Brief in 2019. Uh, John is a former officer in the US Navy. His assignments included positions at sea in Japan, Africa, and also in the Pentagon. You have their bios, and I won't go into all the details, uh, but I will just add that he has also included four years as an instructor on the faculty of the National Intelligence University. Uh, where he's taught coursework on military strategy, intelligence anal analysis, as well as national security policy. Now, next, we have Bethany Ellen Ibrahimian, who um, really is one of the leading public intellectuals uh, on Chinese influence operations, or actually, more specifically, CCP influence operations uh, in the United States. She is a, an award-winning journalist who has covered international affairs for uh, foreign Policy Magazine and the Daily Beast, and she is currently affiliated with the International Consortium for Investigative uh, Journalists. Last but not least, we have um, Nadej Roland, uh, who is a senior fellow at, for political and security affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Her research focuses mainly on China's foreign and defense policy and the changes in regional dynamics across Eurasia resulting from the rise of China. Now, I think one of her 
uh, most recent um, uh, reports on China's Eurasian century has really, um, I think, been one of the uh, premier scholarship on uh, issues related to uh, China's One Belt, One Road initiative, and it's really required reading for anyone who's interested uh, on that um, strategic uh, initiative. And before I turn it over to John, I just want to say that it's, uh, you know, there's a saying, I think, in Chinese that, you know, when uh, what uh, Mao Zedong said to Hua Guofen, you know, <laughs> 你放是我放心. And so I'm really glad to see that you have uh, taken uh, the helm here at the China Brief, and I understand how critical the role of the editor is, and, uh, and really want to applaud you in the direction that you have taken the uh, intellectual focus of the, uh, of the publication to really seriously do, uh, delve into uh, the issues of uh, influence operations. And, uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, John. All right, Russell, uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, and uh, I told people before, uh, in an earlier life in the US Navy, I used to rail against the uh, use of PowerPoint as a means of uh, communication. And so now, in a gross act of hypocrisy, I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation for you this morning, as some forms of brainwashing are very difficult to overcome. Um, but although, do we have a technical problem? OK, sure, one moment. <clears throat> um, what I'd like to uh, talk about this morning is what I call uh, the United Front strategy of subnational engagement, which appears to be emerging, um, or to have been emerging in recent years, as a, a larger component of the CCP's overall uh, strategy uh, for, or efforts for uh, propaganda and foreign influence. Oh, and we're up now. Um, so just click. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay. Um, this, uh, in broad terms, is what I'd uh, like to uh, talk about this morning. Uh, first is about um, outreach to U.S. state governments uh, made by the, uh, by the Chinese government or agencies acting on behalf of the Chinese government. Uh, I wrote a, a piece about this for a China Brief uh, earlier this year, uh, specifically about uh, outreach efforts made to uh, state governments uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S., and I'll, I'll recap that uh, briefly. Um, but I also wanted to build a little bit more uh, upon what I had written earlier this year. Uh, I've done a little bit more uh, research recently about uh, parallel uh, CCP outreach efforts to uh, city-level administrations and mayors in the, uh, in the U.S. Um, and from there, I'd also like to talk a little bit uh, about the lead um, Chinese uh, organization involved in these exchanges, uh, the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries, or CPAFFC, uh, and, and the nature of that organization, what, what it is and, and, and what, its, uh, what its functions are. <clears throat> OK. Um, in May of this year, um, there was a US-China uh, Governors Summit was held. It was the, the US-China Governors Collaboration Summit, uh, which was held in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, this event was co-sponsored uh, by two organizations, the U.S. National Governors Association and the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with, uh, with Foreign Countries. Um, it was noteworthy that uh, among the U.S. participants uh, in this conference, uh, many of the representatives uh, were from states that have been most impacted by ongoing U.S.-China trade frictions, uh, in particular states whose exports have been hit. Uh, in uh, the U.S.-China uh, trade war. Um, in the uh, image that you see on the, uh, the left, uh, the gentleman standing there is the governor of Kentucky, Matt Bevin, who was one of the, uh, who was the host uh, for the conference and one of its uh, leading participants. Uh, the lady standing next to him in the photograph is uh, Miss uh, Li Xiaolin, who is someone we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. She's the director of the CPA uh, FFC. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in the image on the right, uh, you'll see a, a PRC ambassador uh, to the United States, uh, Tsui Tiankai, who was uh, present at this uh, conference and gave an address. And the gentleman uh, with whom he's speaking in the sunglasses, that's uh, Washington State uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Cyrus Habib. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, as with the governor of, of Kentucky participating and, and Mr. Habib representing Washington State, they're both representatives, or I think uh, representatives of states that uh, have been impacted a great deal uh, by U.S.-China trade frictions. Um, alongside uh, Governor Bevin, uh, Governor Lee of Tennessee was also uh, present, 
and spoke at the conference. And I think those two states have a lot of commonalities. Uh, the, uh, there's been you know, plenty of, of discussion, and I think media coverage, about how rural states uh, in, in America uh, have been impacted in terms of their agricultural exports. But there are many other industries in these states that are impacted as well. Uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee, for example, both of them have uh, experienced uh, losses in exports in uh, automotive manufacturing and in distilling. Um, not all of that is entirely due to frictions with China. Some of that is also due uh, to uh, trade frictions and, and tariffs uh, with, the, with the EU. But a large part of it is connected to, uh, to China. Um, for uh, Lieutenant Governor Habib, again, he represents a state that's also been impacted a great deal. Uh, by the, uh, the U.S.-China trade war. China is the number one uh, destination for exports uh, from Washington State, and Washington State has seen a drop in, some, in agricultural products like soybeans, but also in sectors like uh, uh, aircraft manufacturing. So again, it's, it's not coincidental uh, that uh, the representatives from these states were most prominent on the uh, U.S. side in the conference. <clears throat> um, there were two really big themes uh, that emerged from this event. Uh, one was the idea of pragmatic economic cooperation. You know, that you may have uh, sort of more, uh, you, you may have a lot of uh, friction uh, at the national level, but that uh, people who operate at the state, provincial level are much more pragmatic and, and focused on pragmatic uh, economic uh, cooperation. Um, but also, and connected with that, was this idea of, of subnational relations and subnational ties as an important component of keeping U.S.-China uh, ties on track. <clears throat> I wanted to read a couple of uh, brief quotes. <clears throat> uh, one was from uh, Governor Bevin of Kentucky, who, had, who commented at the conference that amid these, uh, these trade disputes at the national level, quote, uh, it is critical that we have at the subnational level the kind of dialogue that is happening uh, here. Uh, we are building those foundations now, building those relationships now, uh, because when this gets worked out at the national level, uh, we will all be ready to come out of the gate at the subnational level in ways that are good, unquote. Um, <clears throat> and similarly, uh, Lieutenant Governor Habib uh, was quoted in Chinese state press, Chinese English language state press, as saying, quote, we are seeing an increased uh, interest of focus on subnational international relations unquote, between the, uh, between the U.S. and, and China. Um, <clears throat> there was only limited media coverage of this event uh, in America, but there was a, quite a bit in the uh, PRC state-controlled English language press. There definitely seemed to be an effort to, to play this up. Um, one final quote I wanted to read uh, was from uh, Cui Tiankai, uh, the uh, PRC ambassador um, to the United States, who was present at the conference and made some rather uh, some pointed comments. Um, he had said, quote, uh, given the current circumstances, it is more important than ever that subnational representatives from China and the United States gather to explore how to advance cooperation and identify win-win opportunities that benefit us all, uh, unquote. Uh, he also took the opportunity for a, a not terribly subtle shot uh, at uh, U.S. Uh, federal uh, officials, uh, stating that in, in heartland states like Kentucky, Quote, uh, I always find true friendship, not groundless suspicions. Our people focus on cooperation, not confrontation, and we share hope for greater engagement and understanding, uh, unquote. And finally, uh, in uh, commenting on the uh, drop in exports that had been seen uh, from states like Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, quote, we need to pay serious attention to this and not let some ill-informed, ill-intentioned people incite a new Cold War at the expense of the people's interests, unquote. So again, not, not terribly subtle there. Um, <clears throat> um, but moving on from there, um, I want to talk a little bit about very similar parallel uh, recent efforts at outreach that have been made to U.S. Uh, mayors and city level uh, administrations uh, this year. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen uh, the controversies that recently ensued uh, when the owner of the Houston Rockets made a uh, relatively innocuous tweet uh, expressing support for uh, protesters in Hong Kong, uh, producing a, a very harsh reaction uh, from PRC officialdom. But at least uh, earlier this summer, anyway, things were a lot friendlier between the city of Houston uh, and, uh, and, and Beijing. <clears throat> um, in uh, July, Houston was the host for the fourth US-China Sister Cities Mayor's Summit. <clears throat> 
um, which stressed a lot of the same themes um, that were on display in the governor's conference uh, in May. The idea of pragmatic uh, economic cooperation, the official theme uh, for this conference was cities mean business. Um, the uh, event was uh, co-sponsored uh, by Sister Cities International, which is a US-based NGO that promotes sister city exchanges. And once again, the CPA, FFC. Um, go on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> there were, um, at, from the PRC side, uh, there were a great many representatives of uh, city administrations as well as some provincial representatives who attended this conference. And I actually have to say, if you compare the list of Chinese participants with the US participants, there seemed to be a higher level of, of Chinese participation, uh, both in terms of number of people present, but also of their, their seniority. Uh, but the, I, doing a look at the agenda uh, for this event, uh, there were visiting officials uh, from uh, a great many cities, and this is only a partial list, from Chengdu, Shenzhen, Changsha, uh, Haikou, and Hainan Island, uh, Fuzhou, Guiyang, Nanchang, Lanzhou, uh, Nanjing, as well as provincial representatives from Yunnan, uh, Shandong, and, uh, and, and Shanxi. So there were a fair number of people uh, present for this. Um, a great many of the uh, Chinese representatives who were in attendance, uh, some of them were from uh, official positions in city administrations uh, in, in China. Uh, a great many of them were also uh, either from uh, regional uh, friendship societies, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, um, and a great many of them were also from provincial level uh, political consultative conferences. And I think that system is something that uh, that Bethany is going to be talking a, a bit more about in in her presentation. <coughs> um, the keynote speaker for this event uh, was a gentleman named uh, Xie Yuan, uh, who is a deputy director of the uh, CPA uh, FFC. And again, a lot of the same themes were being hit. Uh, that you could see in the, the governor's conference. In his uh, speech, or as quoted in, in Xinhua, uh, he stressed the importance of developing people-to-people -people and subnational relationships between uh, China and the United States. Uh, Cui Tiankai uh, did not attend this event in person, uh, but he did um, send a letter, which was uh, read aloud at the, uh, the conference by a, an embassy uh, representative, and once, and once again, uh, pushing forward this idea of the, um, um, the positive results that come from subnational cooperation between pragmatic-minded people uh, at the city and state level and how this can help to keep U.S.-China relations uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> I think it's also noteworthy that, um, again, I, when I was looking for U.S. media coverage of this event, I didn't find all that much, even in uh, just in local area coverage in, in Texas or the Houston area. There was considerable uh, coverage of this in PRC uh, state press, and again, particularly English language uh, state press. <clears throat> um, the uh, two images you see at the bottom of the screen are ones that I, I took from a promotional video about this event that was produced by uh, China Daily um, with the uh, gentleman in the upper left, uh, uh, Liu Jianyang, who's the mayor of Nanchang, who was the, which was the host of the, the previous conference. Uh, and the lady at the bottom right being uh, Carol uh, Robertson Lopez, who is a, um, a former mayor vice tempore of uh, Santa Fe and one of the uh, the hosts for uh, for this event. Um, let me go on to the next slide. <coughs> um, I wanted to throw this in just because it was slightly fun, but I also think it illuminates uh, perhaps how uh, this idea of subnational engagement might be growing somewhat in importance as a uh, component of, uh, of the CCP's overall uh, propaganda efforts. <clears throat> um, the role of the CPA, FFC, and other United Front bodies uh, writ large has been growing under uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, in the photos here, in the, the bottom photo, you can see uh, the ceremony for the signing of the uh, Fuzhou and Tacoma Washington Sister City uh, Agreement. It was uh, signed in the, the mid-90s when Xi Jinping was party boss in, in Fuzhou. Uh, and in the upper image, you can see uh, Xi Jinping's 2015 visit to Tacoma, Washington, and to uh, Lincoln High School, uh, where he reportedly uh, donated a ping pong table to the school and a collection of books on uh, Chinese history. So I imagine now the students at Lincoln High School have uh, opportunities to read about the heroic history of the Chinese Communist Party right in their own uh, school library. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and also, the uh, conferences aren't the only means uh, by which this is being pursued. Uh, I wanted to put up just two other examples uh, right here from, uh, from this year. Uh, in the upper image, uh, you can see a, uh, a classic uh, meeting of princelings. <laughs> You'll see uh, Lee Shaolin, uh, the director of CPA FFC, meeting with uh, former Chicago mayor uh, Richard M. Daly, uh, who, like his father, was a, a long-term uh, mayor in the city of Chicago. I think this visit took place just prior to the uh, uh, Kentucky Governor's Conference. And in the bottom image, uh, bottom image, excuse me, uh, you can see a, a meeting uh, held uh, between uh, Ali Shaolin and uh, the mayor, uh, visiting mayor of uh, Dublin, California. Okay, um, I want to talk for just a moment, and I'll try to wrap this up because I don't want to go too much over on time. Um, I want to talk about what this organization is. Uh, the uh, the Zhongguo Ren Duwei Wai Yu Hao Xie Hui or the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. It's an organization that's been around for a while. Um, it was founded in 1954, uh, largely as a mechanism uh, for the PRC uh, to pursue uh, some at least uh, informal uh, diplomatic exchanges with countries that at that time did not have formal diplomatic relations with the, with the PRC. Um, it is led by uh, the woman in the photograph, uh, it's uh, Li Xiaolin, uh, she's a rather prominent princeling. Her father was uh, Li Xianyan, who was a, a former a PRC state president uh, and one of the, uh, the eight immortals or the eight elders who were very prominent in setting uh, PRC policy uh, in the 1980s. <coughs> um, she's very familiar uh, with America. Uh, she spent much of the 80s and 90s living in the United States, uh, first as a student uh, and then later holding uh, positions with the CPA FFC uh, here in America. Uh, include, and also a term in the early 90s um, in the, uh, where she held a position in the PRC Embassy uh, here in Washington, as well as holding, continuing to hold a concurrent position within the uh, CPA uh, FFC. Um, this organization stands at the apex of a large number of uh, friendship associations uh, within the, uh, the PRC. Um, <coughs> the... Uh, this is, in, in a number of ways, very similar uh, to the system over the network of friendship societies that were employed by the Soviet Union as front organizations uh, during the Cold War. Although I think uh, over time, the uh, network of organizations employed by the PRC has grown to be far more extensive uh, than uh, anything that was ever employed by the, uh, by the Soviet Union. <coughs> um, the CPA FFC is an example of an organization that in official CCP discourse is referred to as a a, a uh, an organization among the people. Um, and it's, it's another example of a front organization employed by the uh, Chinese government that uh, has the outward trappings of a private uh, civic organization, or at least maybe only a semi-governmental uh, civic organization, when in reality it operates wholly as, as part and parcel uh, of, the, uh, of the CCP. <coughs> Um, the CPA FFC um, has, early in its history, had a somewhat sleepier um, existence, but it does seem to have become more active or more prominent in, uh, in the last few years. And in particular, it seems to have taken on a role as the PRC's lead organization uh, for this, uh, this concept or this effort at, at subnational relationships, making outreach to uh, state or provincial governments and to city governments. And this is not uh, only within the United States. I focused on the United States for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, but the CPA FFC has similar uh, efforts ongoing in countries throughout the world, um, in, in Brazil, in, in Denmark, South Africa, again, all, all, you know, all, all throughout the world. Um, I wanted to make a point <coughs> um, about uh, what, what it is and what it is not. Um, the front organizations employed by the PRC can sometimes be confused with one another. Uh, and this organization is not the China Association for International Friendly Contact, which is a parallel and similar but separate uh, front organization uh, for people-to-people -people exchanges that it's operated by the uh, PLA Political Department, International Liaison Department. So again, they're, they're, not, they're not the same. It's also not the Council for the Promotion of the Peaceful Reunification of China, an organization I've, I've written a little bit about um, in the past year. Uh, that is yet another uh, network 
of front organizations that is operated by the United Front Work Department of the Chinese Communist Party. And with that, I'll just kind of conclude with the thought that, uh, or what I wanted to leave you with. <clears throat> I think the CPA FFC is an excellent example of an organization that is, it's a united front organization in the general sense or in the sense of being a, uh, it, it's a united front organization with lowercase letters as a, a common noun, but it is not a part of the United Front Work Department uh, as a proper noun, as a specific uh, bureaucracy within the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And not all of the United Front efforts of the Chinese Communist Party are run by the United Front Work Department. Uh, the United Front efforts of the CCP are much broader and go beyond that one simple uh, you know, bureaucratic shitong uh, or, or system. Uh, I have a, a few other comments about what the um, significance of this might be, but I think I may be risk running over on time, and I think I should probably conclude and take maybe any further comments in the, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, John, and I think you really, you, you really uh, touched on the, and the key, key part of this uh, discussion, which is on organization. And you know, to really understand uh, China's influence operation, we have to understand the organizations involved in it and the syst this network of organizations that are involved in a, a systems, and multiple systems. And the point that I want to make earlier is that we have a tendency in our analysis of China's influence operations to look at these different bureaucracies in, segment in segmented parts, right? The propaganda department and the United Front Work Department and yes, bureaucratically and organizationally, they are separate, but they often reinforce one another. And, uh, and then I think, you know, and then when we look at also the, uh, the central level and provincial level activities, that's when we start looking at that holistically, we can really start to appreciate the scale of, of, of CCP's influence operations. Not to mention, of course, the, the breadth of the uh, uh, international activities. And, and I think what you rem reminded us, John, is that we don't have to look very far to find the types of influence activities that are happening, because they're happening right here, you know, at home. Um, okay, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Bethany. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much, John. That was so fascinating and also a great introduction to what uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be talking about. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Uh, just a quick note, there's a sort of a typo in the, um, uh, the uh, program. It should be conference and not Congress. Um, so United Front activities have taken on renewed importance under Xi Jinping. Since 2015, Xi Jinping has emphasized and empowered United Front work. Uh, beginning in 2015 and completed by the end of 2018, the United Front Work Department was restructured and several new bureaus were created. Overall, the reorganization reflects Greater emphasis on United Front work aimed at overseas Chinese religion and ethnic affairs. So the United Front Work Department is now able to exercise greater influence over overseas Chinese. Um, so the uh, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference in Chinese, that's the Zhongguo Renmin Zhengzhixie Shanghuiyi, or Zhengxie for short. It's a political advisory body that, along with the National People's Congress, meets during the two sessions each March. There are approximately 2,200 members in the current body, though that number can vary. This, and uh, the, I'm gonna refer to it as the CPPCC. Uh, so the CPPCC is a bedrock institution of the United Front, and it's a very traditional manifestation uh, of United Front work. Its delegates are taken from different groups in society, the minority political parties, religious groups, ethnic minorities, the sciences, the arts, agriculture, industry, businesses, and tech. About two-thirds of the delegates are also members of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and I like to think of the CPPCC as like a, a physical manifestation of the idea of united front work. So a positive way to state the purpose of the CPPCC is to make sure that every part of society has a voice in governance. It's consultative, right? You know, consultative democracy or something. Uh, a more negative way to put that, though, is that the CPPCC co-ops emerging leaders from every part of society to make sure that no group is ever outside the guidance of the party. The CPPCC has one national body, but there are also bodies at lower levels of government, from the provinces to the prefecture, uh, prefectures um, to, I don't think actually townships. I have townships, but I, I think it's, 
maybe not, but anyway, provinces and prefectures. Uh, so the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about the overseas delegates to the CPPCC. Now, this is a, a really interesting, um, relatively new part of the CPPCC. Now, most most of these delegates, most uh, CPPCC delegates come from China, but since 2001, when the conference began inviting overseas delegates, each year there are a few dozen. So uh, in Chinese, this is called Hai Wai Bai Biao, often around 35. On the national level, unlike regular CPPCC delegates, they cannot vote. And so far, each overseas delegate only serves in that role once, not for many years. So many conference delegates will um, you know, serve year after year. Uh, but the overseas delegates to the national CPPCC only serve once. But on local levels, it seems that overseas Chinese with a foreign nationality can sit as regular CPPCC delegates and hold that position year after year. So I'll give an example of that later. I've been trying to think of some sort of analogy or to to other governments. You know, it's it's as though you know the U.S. Congress invited non-voting members from countries around the world. It's it's kind of a bizarre. I, I I can't think of any other government that does this in this way. But if if someone is able to think of an example of that, please you know be sure and raise your hand during the comments and, and let me know because I'm, I'm I'd be really curious. Um, so Xu Guanghua is the deputy head of the Committee of Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and Overseas Chinese Affairs of the CPPCC National Committee. And he said this of how these overseas delegates are chosen. There are several standards we consider. They need to have expertise in a certain sphere, have the capability to participate in politics in their home countries, stay influential among overseas Chinese, and most importantly, love China. So let me read a few quotes from a 2014 Global Times article, my favorite publication, um, about overseas delegates, so you can hear how the party tends to talk about them. So the headline, influential overseas Chinese selected to give advice at CPPCC session. Among the approximately 2,000 members of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, one group is quite special. It was a group of 35 Chinese-looking foreigners. Initially from China, they had all acquired foreign nationalities. This overseas delegation consisted of 35 Chinese elites from 21 countries who were invited to offer advice and suggestions during the 2014 CPPCC session. So this is still the Global Times article. Qian Xiaoming, an observer from the US and former commissioner of the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine Policy, was once a key figure in promoting legislation relating to acupuncture at all six administrative levels in the US. In his eyes, in order to promote itself overseas, China needs to contact people of different backgrounds. He pointed out during an internal discussion that China should engage with not just leftists abroad, but people from various different groups. Li Xuelin, president of the Zhejiang UK Association, which is an overseas Chinese group linked to the United Front, proposed during the meeting that members of the group make use of their overseas connections. Quote, local PR companies are more sophisticated at soft power promotion. China can employ these local PR companies in promoting its dream abroad. I have discussed it with a few British PR companies, and they are very interested in helping in this regard. Okay, so that gives you a pretty clear, if brief, picture of what CPPCC overseas delegates are all about. It's an explicit way for Beijing to draw on the talent and connection of overseas Chinese in order to help expand China's influence abroad. There's nothing covert about this. They said it right there on the internet. Uh, what do the delegates get out of it? So this is something that Jerry Groot told me about it. So if you don't know um, Jerry Groot, he researches the United Front, and he's the head of the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Adelaide in Australia. So this is, this is what he said. Being chosen as a CPPCC overseas delegate means that these people are recognized by the Chinese party state. The United Front Department has seen these people as being influential and important in their communities and is seeking to increase or deepen their ties to China as the ancestral land. In rewarding them, those people get status in their communities back home, and in many cases, it increases their influence back home. And that means that these people go back from the CPPCC meeting 
much more committed to supporting the party than they were before. Who gets chosen as CPPCC overseas delegates? There is basically two types of people. So people who are leading members of overseas united front-linked organizations, such as peaceful unification societies and Hui, which are homeland organizations, and, uh, or home, sorry, hometown organizations. And two, overseas Chinese who have made outstanding accomplishments in their respective fields, who may or may not have had any previous links to the United Front. So in recent years, among delegates from the US, this has tended to include scientists. I'm sure we're all shocked by that. It can also be people with government connections. And there's always the mainstay, which is successful business people. One thing I do want to add is that uh, I, I don't think that, so for the people, the second category of person who are successful in whatever field that they do, they may not know what it is that they're doing. You know, they may get an invitation to go attend this thing. They're like, cool, I get to go to Beijing and like talk to people, that's neat. So I'm not implying that of the second type of person that they know that they are, that they're being co-opted or you know, there's an attempt to co-opt them. They may just view this as, uh, you know, a cool thing that they get to do. They're getting recognized by China. So just to make that note. So I'll share with you um, a few profiles of CPPCC overseas delegates from the US. And I was thinking just now, two of them um, live in the greater Washington DC area. I presume they're not in the room, uh, but that'd be pretty funny if they were. <laughs> First one is Gongjin. Okay, um, Gongjin lives in the Washington DC area and has served as a senior advisor to the US Federal Reserve Board since 1996. In 2004, he served as the secretary of the Washington Tongxiang Hui. Um, and he would speak at events such as, and I'll, the name of that organization is the Huashengden Di Chu Tongxiang Hui Xie Hui. Yeah. That's right. And would speak at events such as the opening of the George Washington University Peaceful Reunification Association. Um, I don't think that organization exists anymore, or it was folded into the Greater Washington, D.C. Peaceful Unification Society. So in 2014, while he was still holding his position at the Federal Reserve Board, he served as an overseas delegate to the CPPCC. Um, so the second profile. Uh, so I would say that he is uh, kind of between one and two, right? So he's like a very prominent person in his field, but he also uh, has been actively involved in uh, um, United Front stuff. So the second person is Helen He, and I have, so He Xiaohui is her name. I wonder if she's here. Um, probably not. Um, she, I have written a pretty lengthy profile of her previously. So she's the leading United Front figure in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, she came to the United States in 1988. In the 2000s, she became politically active in Maryland, lobbying the state government to make the Chinese New Lunar New Year an official holiday, founding an umbrella group for Chinese hometown associations called the Coordination Council of Chinese American Associations and organizing voter drives in the Chinese community. In 2005, He said in an interview with official party mouthpiece People's Daily that Chinese people in America should get involved in civic spaces to oppose Taiwan independence and to, quote, fight for the support of American people for China to achieve unification. In 2009, while serving as president of the Chinese Hometown Associations Group, Helen He was invited to Beijing to serve as an overseas delegate. And what did she do after that? In 2010, she was awarded the Maryland Governor's Volunteer Service Award. She's also donated to the campaigns of local and state level politicians. In April 2018, in an interview with Chiao Bao, which is um, a US based Chinese language newspaper that uh, essentially functions as a state media outlet, um, although not technically so, He criticized the Taiwan Travel Act. Um, which makes it easier for government officials from the U.S. and Taiwan to visit each other. And, the, and she also criticized the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act, saying that they, quote, interfered in China's internal affairs and seriously violated the One China Principle. The last person uh, that I will profile here, and then I'll, I'll finish up after that, is a guy named Howard Lee. So Li Xuehai is his Chinese name. Howard Lee is an example of an overseas Chinese with US citizenship who has returned to live in China. So he's a Haigui. Uh, in 1981, when he was in the US, Lee founded something called the Waytex Group, which is a global logistics and real estate company based in New York. 
it's been very successful. Forbes Asia named Lee as one of the top, uh, one of the 25 most influential Chinese Americans in American business. In 2005, the U.S. Department of Commerce appointed Li Shuhai or Howard Lee as chairman of the uh, chairman of the Department of Commerce's Minority Business Development Conference. In 2006, President Bush appointed Howard Lee as White House Advisor for Asia Pacific Affairs. Uh, he's also the co-chairman of the Committee of 100 Greater China Region. And he is an ongoing member of the Tianjin Municipal Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which he currently holds, and he's held that for several years. So that would be the local level, the municipal level of a CPPCC. So he's an example of someone who is a, a member of CC. A, a CPPCC delegate um, at a local level has been for several years. It's an ongoing position that he continues to hold. I don't know. I I don't know how long he's been in that in that position. I wasn't able to find that. I don't know if he held that position while he was appointed by President Bush as a White House advisor for Asia Pacific Affairs. Um, but to give you a sense of the kinds of people that the party targets uh, for these positions as overseas delegates. Bethany, and there's always a very detailed expose in uh, in all your uh, remarks, and uh, I think you you know you, again it just emphasizes the key importance of organization here in our discussion, and to really understand you know influence operation, we have to understand the organizations involved um, in it and the people as well. And I think what you've also uh, noted there is a, a focus on 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 Taiwan in uh, in some of the objectives that they have, but. I think as we will hear from Nadej and, um, and, and also uh, that is cons uh, what I've also found in research I have done, it's not all about Taiwan. You know, it's about Tibet, it's about Xinjiang, it's about all these other area, all these sort of core interests uh, that CCP defines and, you know, becomes, and it's, it's quite evolving as well. And so, um, you know, again, United Front reinforces a lot of these uh, broader, um, you know, uh, strategic objectives. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Nadej. Thank you very much. Um, well, thanks to Jamestown um, and GTI for the opportunity um, to address two of my favorite hobby horses in the one presentation, the Belt and Road and United Front Operations. Um, and I think BRI is exactly the example of that. Um, it's not just about Taiwan. Um, it, it applies to many other areas uh, that are deemed strategic uh, to the party state. Um, so since the launch of BRI in 2013, um, the uh, initiative has received a lot of attention, and thanks in part to the enormous uh, propaganda campaign that uh, Beijing has put forward to, uh, uh, to, um, to support it, many people have started to acknowledge that BRI is very important uh, to Beijing. And they have started also to recognize it as a key feature of, of uh, Beijing's foreign policy. And as it started to make actual progress beyond the official discourse, um, I think people have started to recognize that there's a strategic dimension uh, behind the Belt and Road that the CCP has tried to water down. Um, less is known, however, uh, about the mechanisms behind this very well-oiled um, a propaganda campaign, influence cam campaign, campaign that's taking place globally and that the CCP has set on motion to support uh, the BRI. And overall, the purpose of this global influence campaign is to transform negative forces into positive forces, uh, to uh, shape foreign uh, uh, perceptions and behaviors in a manner that are favorable to the BRI while at the same time inhibiting some of the potential counter responses or criticism. So it, it, uh, they're, they're trying to persuade and induce individuals, groups of individuals and governments so that they participate in, they endorse, they cooperate with, or at a minimum do not counter um, uh, the BRI and its uh, geostrategic aims. And for that, um, the, there are two main instruments that are in use and that overlap and that are very much intertwined, as you said, Russell, there. Um, one is uh, propaganda and the other one is United Front Tactics. The propaganda aims at controlling the dominant discourse and at saturating the bandwidth with some positive narrative 
while at the same time isolating uh, the challenging or critical or counter narratives. And the United Front tactics aim at building some useful coalitions uh, outside of the CCP in, in support of the BRI goals um, as assigned by the party state. Uh, mobilize those coalitions to influence political decisions um, in favor of the BRI, while at the same time reducing the possibility of counter responses. And to that end, um, uh, Beijing has created specific United Front entities um, for the purpose of the smooth expansion and global acceptance of the BRI. So historically, the main target of United Front activities outside of the PRC has been uh, the Chinese diaspora. <clears throat> but with the considerable expansion of Xi Jinping's foreign policy uh, agenda, those activities have been brought to new regions uh, where overseas Chinese communities are not necessarily well established. And here, the traditional United Front approaches has given way to some sort of creative adaptation uh, which is reflected in the extended web of new entities um, that have been specifically devoted uh, to pushing forward the BRI objectives. So um, I'm just going to go over the, uh, the persuasion side, the external propaganda effort, and then I will try to focus a bit more on those uh, entities um, in support of the United Front work. The Chinese propaganda apparatus has worked over time to design and, and propagate a narrative that emphasizes the benevolent and cooperative nature of the BRI and its objectives of shared win-win outcomes. So I think we are all familiar with the uh, usual tropes about BRI being a generous contribution to public goods, um, which will help reduce the infrastructure gap, tackle poverty, poverty alleviation, promote green development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also some defensive tropes in the narrative. BRI is not a geopolitical game. It's not a China club. It doesn't have any strategic intentions. Really, the aim here is to oversaturate the bandwidth uh, in order to isolate any alternative narrative that doesn't fit with the CCP's version of reality. Um, the BRI narrative has been disseminated through numerous channels, uh, starting with the top leadership itself um, and their official diplomatic visits abroad, the BRI forums, the Chinese embassies over four continents that have relayed also the narrative, uh, very proactive. Um, Ambassadors have taken the stage in local events, or, oft or often also written columns in uh, the local press to extol the huge potential of uh, the initiative. We have had countless uh, Silk Road themed international events, um, usually sponsored by Chinese entities organized around the world. Uh, media has also been widely used to spread the BRI narrative worldwide. Uh, uh, via the usual channels uh, that the central propaganda department controls. Um, <clears throat> but really what's interesting is that in parallel with this sort of classic traditional propaganda campaign, uh, we have seen an accelerated United Front work um, aimed at developing a network of, of friends that are amenable to serving um, um, the CCP's interests. And uh, those, the, the CCP has created a web of entities that really act as proxies for the party state uh, in support of the BRI agenda. And they're presenting themselves as friendly platforms for international cooperation, obscuring the fact that they are, they are in fact tools of the party state on a mission to support a national strategy. And these entities pursue three main targets. Uh, the media, people in the media, people in think tank and universities, and people in business. I have cataloged them in a paper published by Synopsis last August. You can find it online if you're interested in the detail of each entity. I won't, um, I won't list them here because it's a little bit tedious, but um, uh, just looking at the three uh, communities that are targeted by these entities. Uh, First, 
the Central Propaganda Department is using BRI as a rallying theme to seek cooperation uh, with foreign media outlets. The objective is to reach out directly to foreign journalists and media outlets to create and nurture a pool of friends that will absorb and deliver made in China propaganda through their local media channels. For example, the Belt and Road Media Cooperation Union was launched in 2016 by the State Council Information Office, uh, which is the State Council name for the CCP Central Office of Foreign Propaganda. This alliance aims at pooling resources, encouraging joint program production, disseminating, marketing, and jointly presenting, and here I quote, authentic, accurate, inspiring, and intriguing stories of the Belt and Road. These, I think, authentic and intriguing Belt and Road stories are created by the CCP Central Propaganda Office, which keeps editorial control over substance. And then those prefabricated products are provided to media outlets in Belt and Road countries that do not necessarily have the financial resources or technical means to produce uh, content independently. This method is an illustration of the tactic that is known as borrowing a boat um, to go out to the sea, which is using a local entity to promote the Chinese party state propaganda to foreign audiences. Um, the Belt and Road uh, United Front entities have also been created to specifically target public intellectuals uh, who work in think tank and universities. Um, as with journalists, uh, they aim to influence and shape these public intellectuals' perceptions so that they view BRI as a positive undertaking. These platforms uh, sponsor and organize international seminars and workshops that provide countless channels of communication through which to relay the party line and the BRI's positive narrative. So here, international participants are expected to absorb the information uh, given by their Chinese counterparts, and perhaps even to integrate them into their own analysis. If there are foreign think tankers, there's a possibility that this information might eventually <coughs> appear in their reports that they produce for their respective government, um, hence directly impacting the local policymakers' perception of BRI. The platforms that specifically target universities aim to gain access to knowledge, skills, and technologies studied in foreign university research centers and laboratories. And this is part of a broader effort to serve uh, the same objective uh, through a multitude of other mechanisms. It also aims to uh, become engaged in foreign educational systems, especially in the developing Belt and Road countries, and as a longer term effort to shape um, how the future generations of local elites are educated and trained. <coughs> Finally, the business community has also become one of the favorite targets of China's push for shaping international perceptions about the BRI as a positive endeavor. Here, the United Front operations um, play on a very familiar ground. Um, the international corporate world has for decades been, uh, been nurtured and, and coaxed into believing promises of profitable gains uh, that the massive Chinese market and the growing Chinese economy would offer. Local business communities have been used as uh, lobby groups nudging their government representatives uh, to favor policies of engagement with China. And similar themes are now weaved around uh, BRI. To the worldwide business community, the BRI-related narrative is generally one of uh, an opportunity not to be missed. And the United Front work uh, aims to ensure that Beijing's messages about BRI's peaceful intentions, um, closer economic ties, uh, are thereby given greater legitimacy. Um, here, the expected outcomes are twofold. One, to attract foreign businesses to work on concrete Belt and Road projects, especially in sectors where um, Chinese companies lack competence, 
and two, to cultivate the local businessmen and prominent economic actors to gain increased access to politicians and high-ranking civil servants of Belt and Road countries. <clears throat> Here, the message dissemination and co-optation process is conducted via multiple mechanisms uh, that take the form, among others, of association for the promotion of international trade, Silk Road Business Councils, and Silk Road Chambers of Commerce. So as a conclusion, and then we can, of course, discuss that during the Q&A session, um, when you examine all those entities, first of all, there's a lot of them. Um, you can see also that, um, as we, I think, demonstrated today, the United Front work is not limited within a specific bureaucracy. I think this is very important to understand. It's a, it's a work that has to be done by every member of the CCP. And it can also be very innovative. It can take the shape uh, and use new channels. Uh, it can uh, evolve in some, in some way and be very creative. But ultimately, the goal remains the same. It's to forge temporary tactical alliances uh, with local elites in areas that are beyond the party control. Uh, and to advance the CCP strategic goals. Um, so that's, that's something very important. You might um, use new bottles, but it's the same wine that's inside of it. So with well, that, I'll conclude. Thank you. That's fantastic, Nadej. And I think you've closed on an excellent point there, which is that this is a whole of society a strategy. And I think as we consider different countermeasures, there has to be a discussion about a whole of society approach, at least in my view, um, to, uh, to dealing with this, uh, the challenges of CCP influence operations in United Front. Now, we have about uh, 19 minutes uh, for Q&A. I know that we always have a very well-informed audience um, in, uh, in the crowd today so um, at these events. So I'd like to open it up, but I do have a, uh, several uh, prepared questions uh, for my speakers. Um, so I'm, let me open it up and please uh, raise your hand, state your name as well as your affiliation, and please direct your questions uh, to whichever speaker. Uh, gentleman in the back over there. Hi, my name is Jeff Wong from Radio for Asia. My question is for, for Chong. Uh, you mentioned about some facts in which um, there are outreach to um, state governments and the city governments. Those are facts, but uh, you didn't explain how this activity can influence uh, people in the U.S. through these activities. Can you uh, say something about that? Okay, great. Uh, sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, thanks for the question. <clears throat> Those were actually some points that I, I uh, might have tried to address in my presentation, but again, I knew I was running over on time and needed to, uh, to cut it short. <clears throat> um, in, in terms of, of outreach projects like that, um, uh, I would say um, I'm not paranoid about them. Uh, and I don't say that uh, just because you go into a meeting or a conference uh, with Chinese interlocutors who are, are representatives of a, a Chinese government front organization, I don't think that necessarily means you go into that meeting and you come out as a pod person <laughs> or fully programmed or anything like that. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, and I'm also, I would, I mean, I'm not advocating for exchanges like that to be shut down or, or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> I, I think there actually can be uh, some positive value um, in having things like sister city relationships or sister city uh, exchanges. I think it has some value uh, for promoting cultural activities and, and so forth. Um, where I would sound a, a note of caution, though, is I think the um, on the U.S. side, uh, people who go into exchanges like that, again, whether you're talking about conferences or individual meetings or, or what have you, um, is just to go in informed and, and understand who it is that you're dealing with. Um, and it's not always the case, but I think there can sometimes be uh, a certain naivete uh, on the part of people uh, who come from um, more open, pluralistic, and democratic societies 
um, democratic societies, which do have a large number of genuine uh, grassroots civic organizations. Um, and they may sh have a naive assumption that their Chinese interlocutors uh, are what they present themselves as being, that these are representatives of sort of bottom-up grassroots um, uh, organizations. Uh, but when you're dealing with an organization like the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries, as just one example of many that, that could be cited, uh, this is not a genuine grassroots civic organization. It is a Chinese Communist Party organization, and it's one that's being used as a channel for narrative messages that the CCP wishes to promote. Um, again, I don't think it was anything conscious uh, at all, but I think, again, if you look at some of the materials uh, for the, the two conferences that I mentioned in my presentation, the, the Governor's Conference in Kentucky and then the Mayor's Office, uh, excuse me, the mayor's conference, rather, in, in Houston. Um, the, in, in statements that were e either made by or at least attributed to uh, U.S. participants, it, it becomes eerie how many of them track with Chinese Communist Party propaganda narratives. And I don't think that's intentional. I don't think it's conscious. Um, I think it's more of an unconscious process that comes from being exposed uh, consistently to narrative messages pushed by Chinese government front organizations. So um, if there's a, a danger or a downside to exchanges um, such as these, I would identify it as being just that, um, that CCP narratives can enter our own discourse and perhaps without our even really thinking about it or, or being uh, aware of it, it can, it can be very subtle. Uh, but again, uh, th that said, um, again, I'm not, I don't want to advocate um, hysteria or paranoia about any exchanges like that. Um, I actually think it's, it's a good idea to have sort of state to state, city to city exchanges, whatever the case may be. Uh, but again, uh, U.S. participants involved in such activities should just be aware of who it is that they're dealing with. Thanks, John. I think that's that's a great point. Situational awareness, I think that's very important um, in order to guard against uh, these types of um, malign influence operations. More questions? The lady over there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. Uh, Claudia Rosette with the Independent Women's Forum. Um, Bethany, just quickly, the closest model to what you were asking about, I think, is the United Nations. I'd be happy to talk about that with you. Um, but my question is, uh, the hope for so long was that the kind of contacts you're describing would convert the Chinese side of it. Uh, could you, any of you, tell us a little bit more about what motivates the Chinese end of this in its zeal to convert, persuade, subvert, et cetera? What is it? Is it rewards back home? Is it fear? Is it what's behind it? Um, thanks for that great question. I, I can speak to you um, narrowly uh, an answer to that question about, about what I talked about today. So I think there's two things that motivate this. And the, the first one is, is basically a sense of extraterritoriality. If you look at um, the CPPCC, uh, you know, they have... Um, you know, like little caucuses in there um, for, you know, representatives from Taiwan, uh, which is odd, right? Uh, and overseas Chinese. Um, and it's, it's part of this, this sort of sense that the CCP has that everyone who is ethnically Chinese, whether or not they're Chinese nationals, belong to them. They own them. And if you believe that, well, then you might as well have them participate in their, you know, supposedly representative government because they're still yours. So I would say that that is, is one motivating factor. The second one, and uh, I think this has come to play a greater and greater role um, in how the CCP relates to the rest of the world, is a desire to get as much as it can from everywhere that it can at all times. And um, it has increasingly viewed the diaspora as um, you know, this incredible resource to be mined uh, and to be, if you want to use this word, co-opted. So, you know, our diaspora, you know, has all this wonderful expertise about how to, um, you know, make money abroad, how to do investment abroad. You know, let's tap that. 
you can have a debate and and I think there's you know there's, there's obviously different elements within the party um, you know right now we have a really hardline element that is that is in power not everyone is like that you know there there are people and there were people who genuinely wanted China to open up and move towards you know a more sort of open society they just simply don't have power very much power right now but you know maybe 20 years ago when uh, or sorry 18 years ago when these overseas delegates as this when it was started in 2001 i can't say that this was part of the CCP's diabolical plan to try to increase their, you know, the authoritarian influence in Western democracies. Maybe it was. Maybe some people wanted it to be that way. But I think other people genuinely wanted to just sort of mine that expertise. However, I do think that it has become much more nefarious. Um, and you know, so I mentioned one person. Um, you know, in 2005, he was, um, you know. Uh, 2006, he was appointed by President Bush as a White House advisor for Asia Pacific Affairs. You know, if he in 2006 had served as an overseas delegate, you know, I would think, well, it's kind of weird, but you know, maybe it's okay. But if that happened now, I would think 100%. They want to co-opt him. They want to use his position in the government to try to, you know, sway the U.S. government to do things more in line with the CCP. Um, so I'll leave it there. If I may add something, I think you, you cannot really understand these activities if you don't just go back to the nature of the CCP. These are tactics that are basically inherited from the Leninist heritage, right? So um, this is about, um, uh, again, cr it, it stems from this idea that when you are the weakest revolutionary um, party, and you want to have a revolution. I mean, the CCP today is actually not a revolution party anymore, but this is the, the heritage of their own history and of their own structure and of their own ideology as well. You, you create those um, um, temporary networks and alliances outside of the party, outside of your own control, in order then to achieve your objectives. It's, it's war without fighting. It's achieving a political objecti objective without waging war. So it's, it's another form of warfare, um, but it's alliances that are created with specific groups that can help you achieve this political or strategic objective. For, for an individual who's the forward deployed end of this, what is his incentive not to go over to the other side? Why does he go back home as a loyal subject? That's what I'm essentially asking. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a mix of, uh, you know, I mean, more and more pride. I mean, all the achievements that the CCP has uh, purportedly given to the country. There's a sense of status, there's a sense of also access, because all of this, uh, you know, the status that the people involved in, in United Front is also giving them access back home, prestige, um, some sort of reward. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all of that. And Willie? Oh, hi, <coughs> this is Willie Lam from the JP Stan Foundation. Well, I'd like to ask a, but, uh, ask a question about the rough budget for the um, United Front and propaganda efforts. I, I know it's uh, very difficult to answer because this is top class uh, state secret. But I think we all know that the Chinese economy is going through rough patches, and uh, particularly regarding the BRI. Uh, we have seen uh, the banks being driven to land, uh, often at perhaps um, inadequate uh, conditions. And also, um, about 80% of the uh, Chinese-initiated BRI projects are being run by state-owned enterprise conglomerates, and most of these conglomerates are actually losing money. So, um, as a economic proposition, the BRI might not be um, a viable project in the long term, but certainly I agree with, uh, with the three of you that um, they do make sense in projecting both Chinese hard and soft power. But I just want to ask a question about whether the ongoing credit crunch, which seems to have been, seems to have been inflicted upon the Chinese government, might have on its um, otherwise extraordinary 
well-run um, propaganda and United Front efforts. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important question, but it's, it, it's a question for China's future as a whole, not just uh, about the sustainability of the Belt and Road project. Um, several, I'm, I'm, I don't know about the overall budget, uh, first. Second, um, those uh, projects are not necessarily fully financed by China itself. You know, there, there's a lot of burden, financial burden sharing with other, uh, uh, especially international financial institutions. Uh, third, um, what we're talking about here in terms of propaganda and influence operations, there's actually a drop in the bucket. It's This is not very expensive, uh, you know, just to have a, a people invited in China or uh, conferences or just creating those platforms. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, but the impact is much more important in terms of shaping, again, the perceptions and the behaviors. So, um, and that's, I think that's also why they're, they're just doubling down on them because it's not very, it's not very expensive, uh, but it has a, a lot of impact. Uh, I certainly don't have any numbers for you, um, but if you look at, I mentioned the restructuring of the United Front Works Department. It was also promoted to a, I'm going to get this wrong, but um, to like basically like a central committee level uh, department. Um, so it, it, you know, in, in the past three years. So it, it is, um, I, I presume, getting more money, not less, despite the uh, the state of the, the Chinese economy. Um, and again, with at least with its, uh, you know, China's um, external propaganda efforts, you know, if you look at CGTN, um, they've made a, a huge push in the past couple of years to, what's it called, Voice of China, putting together all their propaganda efforts into one sort of unified platform called Voice, Voice of China, maybe. Um, Again, I would think that that, I, I, I'm just guessing here, but that the amount of money being put towards that is more and not less, uh, despite the, the Chinese economy. To give you just a sense of the scale, uh, the last publicly available estimate that I've seen, at least in regards to United Front operations in Taiwan provided by uh, Taiwan government estimate was that uh, 2017 to 2018, around 300 million. And that's just in Taiwan alone. All right. And that's, you know, we can obviously, there's a lot to sort of dissect there in terms of what do you sort of account for in terms of um, uh, for United Front operations. But give you a sense in, the, in terms of the scale. And, and given the fact that, you know, General Secretary Xi Jinping has a time again referred to United Front as one of the magic weapons, you know, for the CCP, uh, and in particular with the emphasis of the upcoming 2020 elections in Taiwan, uh, my guess is that those, you know, that they're not sparing, um, uh, you know, any uh, resources uh, to engage in uh, influence operations there. Um, so uh, that's, that's my quick response here. Uh, yes, Tina Chong with uh, Voice of America's Chinese branch. Uh, I, I'm following up on the uh, question of uh, CCP's uh, exporting its narrative and uh, asking or promoting, you know, asking uh, U.S. businesses to uh, parody it, its uh, narrative or its uh, One China principle. So uh, for John, uh, Mr. Dawson, uh, about uh, the latest uh, situation with MBA and uh, China, uh, the tension and the uh, controversy. Uh, can you talk about is is that something that we're seeing uh, a, a powerful U.S. organization, business uh, organization, is uh, standing up to China, or is this something else? It's unrelated. Uh, it's only for uh, you know uh, its business. Thank you. Uh, sure. Okay. Well, I can hardly close. Uh, but at, at least as, as far as I would see it, I would see the uh, recent controversy involving the NBA and China as a, a classic example of how American business um, it ha is, has been forced to uh, self-censor, to police itself in order to avoid losing uh, access to the, the market in the, the PRC. Uh, I mean, the NBA is an American business that has been particularly successful in spreading and marketing uh, itself in the uh, in the PRC, uh, you know, basketball is is a very popular sport, uh, and uh, the NBA is huge in China, uh, and I think you saw in very <laughs> rapid um, <clears throat> after uh, uh, Daryl Morey, the owner of the Houston Rockets, made again what I 
what I would see is a relatively innocuous tweet uh, that produced a, uh, a firestorm. You could really see NBA officials scrambling over themselves uh, to try to placate uh, Chinese officialdom. And even not just the NBA, uh, but other elements of the U.S. sports industry, ESPN, uh, for example, which was issuing directives uh, to its, uh, its commentators to be very cautious in, in what they say and to avoid doing anything that could uh, offend uh, Chinese officialdom. Uh, so I, I see that whole incident as, as an excellent example of how, well, I would say maybe just the most recent and perhaps one of the most visible examples of how U.S. businesses have, uh, have self-censored in order to uh, maintain access to the, uh, the Chinese market. Uh, the program South Park may not be everyone's cup of tea, um, <laughs> but if it is, uh, South Park recently produced a very pointed uh, episode uh, about uh, which was uh, satirizing um, the extent to which Hollywood is uh, self-censoring uh, to maintain access to the, the Chinese market. So per perhaps even if you're not a fan of South Park, and I'm not a regular watcher of it either, I had to check out the one episode. Uh, I think that one is noteworthy for what it had to say about the phenomenon of, of self-censorship in, in Hollywood. Huh. That, uh, we've run out of time. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> and I'm sure that we are now approaching a coffee break. We have a coffee break from 1025 to 1045. I know that there were some other questions in the audience. Um, you know, I encourage you to please, um, you know,